Okay, um, so Kelly set my talk up very nicely. Um, today I'm gonna talk about uh, what drives germline mutation dependence on sex, age, and time. And uh, I say human germline mutation in the title, but I'm gonna make somewhat more ambitious claims about maybe mammalian mutation rates in general. And so the work I'm gonna talk about uh, was led by Tsui Gao, who's a current graduate student in my lab, um, uh, was a former graduate student in my lab, and is currently a postdoc in Jonathan Pritchard's lab at Stanford. And then some of the data analysis I'll talk about uh, was done primarily by Priya Morjani, a former postdoc in the lab who's now a professor at UC Berkeley, and then a current graduate student in the lab, Felix Wu. So I'm gonna talk about germline mutation, uh, like Kelly, i.e. any mutation that occurs between the zygote and sperm or zygote and egg. Therefore, mutations that could accumulate either uh, in the cell lineage ancestral to the germ cell uh, in the development of the parent before sexual differentiation or after sexual differentiation or in the germline. And the questions that I'm gonna be focusing on today um, are questions about point mutations and specifically how point mutations accumulate over evolutionary time, a question of paramount importance obviously to evolutionary biologists, as well as questions of interest to human geneticists in particular, such as how and why do mutation rates depend on age and sex, and how do they accumulate over development? And what I'm gonna hopefully make clear um, in this talk is that I think all of these questions, first of all, are intimately, intimately intertwined, and second of all, um, all sort of boil down to this most fundamental question that Kelly has uh, given us a lot of insight about in this talk and in her previous work about how germline mutations arise in the first place. So what do I mean by how germline mutations arise? Well, in principle, of course, germline mutations can have many uh, different sources, and we can think of these as falling into sort of two general categories as a sort of first order approximation. You could imagine that uh, they arise from replication error, from the act of copying DNA itself, and for example, the accidental misincorporation of a DNTP. Or you could imagine that uh, they're due to damage to errors that accrue because of exogenous or endogenous mutagens, and then these errors go uncorrected or are improperly corrected by the next round of DNA replication, and a mutation ensues. Um, and of course, this dichotomy is an oversimplification because, in fact, these processes interact. For example, the act of copying DNA can, in fact, induce damage. Um, but it's sort of a useful uh, classification, I think, and it's one that's, that's been broadly conceived of in the literature. And so if you look up almost any textbook, uh, what you will learn is that if you're thinking specifically of germline mutations as opposed to somatic mutations, uh, the vast majority of those are thought to arise from replication errors. And in humans, um, I would argue that there's two mine, main lines of evidence that have led people uh, to that conclusion, uh, despite the fact that, as, as we've already seen and as I'll discuss and others will discuss, uh, we've known for a long time that not all errors in, uh, not all germline mutations are due to damage. So one line of evidence is the so-called generation time effect, right, which was first observed in evolutionary biology in the 80s, um, but <coughs> Here's a more recent plot from uh, Melissa wilson Sarah's PhD work, which is just the observation that uh, species that are more short-lived uh, evolve more rapidly uh, than uh, species that are longer-lived. And so here, for example, is a phylogeny in which different, uh, the length of different branches reflects the number of substitutions, and you can see that rodents have accumulated more substitutions per unit time than have primates. And you see this pattern across mammals. You also see it um, within mammalian groups, so for example, uh, a couple of years ago now, Priya Morjani and Eduardo Amarim in my lab used alignments of different primate species, um, whole genome alignments, sort of focusing on putatively neutral subsets of the genome, um, and they observed, as had been noted before based on a bit less data, that, for example, old world monkeys evolve more rapidly than do apes, so old world monkeys with a generation time of maybe 10 to 12 years or so uh, evolve maybe 40% on average uh, faster than do uh, old world monkeys that might have, sorry, than do apes that might have a generation time of 25 to 80 or so. So this was kind of one line of, ev oh, sorry, forgot to tell you something. So there's many ways in which you could interpret this pattern, um, but the sort of one that has stuck in the literature is that it reflects the number of cell divisions that occur per unit time. Because if you imagine that these different species undergo the same number of cell divisions from egg to sperm or egg to 
no, from, sorry, zygote to sperm, or I haven't, didn't have enough coffee this morning, from zygote to sperm or zygote to egg, then um, if they do so more rapidly, they necessarily go through more cell divisions per unit time, and so copy DNA more often per unit time, therefore more mutations arise per unit time and more neutral substitutions. And so this observation that mutations accumulate more rapidly in shorter-lived species was one line of support, obviously an indirect one, that uh, seemed to indicate that indeed mutations arise due to errors in replication. But of course, the strongest line of evidence to that effect comes not from comparing different mammalian species, but uh, human males and females. And the reason that that's an informative comparison is because the developmental trajectories of male and female germlines are so markedly different. So in humans, it's thought that after a primordial germ cell specification, there's approximately 15 cell divisions that lead to the creation of primary oocytes. And those oocytes are then in stasis with no further DNA replication until ovulation and fertilization. In contrast, it's males, it's thought that there's maybe 20 or so cell divisions uh, that lead to the production of spermatogonial stem cells. These barely divide or don't divide until puberty, and then an estimated 23 cell divisions per year uh, throughout the male lifespan. And what that means is that if you think of the number of cell divisions that a germ cell has gone through by the age of the future parent, then if parents could reproduce by birth, they would have very, have, their germ cells would have gone through very similar numbers of cell divisions. If they reproduce at puberty, same thing, pretty similar numbers of cell divisions. But if they reproduce at age 30, then the male germ cell will have gone through an order of magnitude more cell divisions than the female germ cell. And what that means is that if mutations are due to errors in replication to the act of copying DNA, then we might expect them to look something like this picture. Not exactly like this picture because, of course, per cell division mutation rates likely vary over ontogenesis, but something like this picture, in the sense that we would expect most mutations to come from males rather than females, and we would expect a linear, potentially, or at least an increase uh, in the number of mutations with paternal age. And we can now um, test these predictions using next generation sequencing by doing the sort of brute force experiment of sequencing parents and children and looking for variants that are carried in reads of the kid, but not the parent, and therefore must have arisen de novo in the last generation. And there have been dozens of studies to do that in humans uh, since the first application to, of this uh, approach in humans by Lee Hood's group. And they find, uh, at least originally, pictures that are quite consistent with this cartoon. So here, for example, <laughs> Uh, is a plot by, uh, published in a paper by the company Decode, uh, where the work was led by Augie Kong and colleagues. Um, and what you see here uh, in their data set, first of all, uh, about three quarters of mutations were paternal in origin. And what you're seeing on this plot on the y-axis is the number of mutations inherited by a child from both mother and father, and on the x-axis, the age of the father at conception. And you can see that there's a good fit of just a line uh, through these data. So obviously, we didn't need, or maybe not obviously, but we didn't need next generation sequencing data uh, to tell us that this picture uh, was more or less what was going on. In fact, Weinberg, close to a century ago now, already hypothesized the existence of a paternal age effect. And comparisons of sex chromosomes and autosomes and rates of evolution of sex chromosomes and autosomes had already informed us that about three quarters of mutations were paternal in origin. So already in 2000, for example, in his authoritative review on the topic, Jim Crow concludes that the germline mutation rate in human males, especially older males, is generally much higher than in females, mainly because in males there are many more germ cell divisions. And so this was the second and stronger line of evidence that suggested that mutations um, are due to errors in replication, at least primarily. But of course, all the meanwhile, uh, we did appreciate that not all mutations have that source. And in particular, we knew quite a lot about the origin of uh, spontaneous deaminations at methylated CPGs, a topic that uh, Kelly already mentioned. So just to remind you, uh, when CPGs are not methylated, then the C spontaneously deaminates to a U. That actually has a glycosylated UDG that's dedicated to recognizing it and fixing it, so it actually leads to quite low rates of mutation. However, when the, the CPG is methylated, the C deaminates to a T, which is a natural base and much less readily recognized and therefore more likely to generate a mutation. 
And so when we started thinking about this about five years ago now, we were trying to think through what we might expect to happen in that case where actually mutations are not due to replication errors but due to damage. How might we expect those mutations to accrue with age and sex? And we realized that we didn't really know what to expect because there wasn't kind of an explicit model in the literature. And so we wrote one down, um, and specifically this is again the work of Tiwe, um, and it's a very simple model which I'm showing you in its kind of most vanilla form. So here's a model of how you might think of CPG deamination occurring in which a methylated CPG deaminates at some fixed instantaneous rate mu, and so a C becomes a T on one of the strands, and if replication occurs before repair, then a mutation arises in one of the daughter cells. Um, we can further imagine that there's a fixed instantaneous repair rate, R, and in this version at least, that if repair happens, then it always happens accurately, which means that if then DNA replication occurs, no mutation arises. And so the full model just looks like this, and we can solve this differential equation for the proportion of mutated bases as a function of time since the last cell division. And what we see is just this pattern here, which interestingly um, has sort of two limiting behaviors. So in one limiting behavior, we imagine that we're taking the, the limit where repair is really inefficient relative to uh, the cell division, to the length of the cell cycle. And in that case, as is sort of intuitively obvious, to a first order approximation, uh, repair doesn't matter, and the number of mutations just accrues in proportion to absolute time, at least under the assumption of a fixed instantaneous uh, damage rate. Um, on the other, it's the other kind of limiting behavior that I think is less intuitive, and that's what happens when repair is very efficient relative uh, to the length of the cell cycle. Because then actually you reach an asymptote where even though uh, the mutations are non-replicative in origin, uh, they, the cell basically inherits a fixed number of mutations more or less independent of the time since the last cell division. And intuitively, you can think of that case as reflecting the fact that the few mutations, the few errors that tend to become mutations are those that occur right before uh, the DNA is replicated. And so in that uh, limiting behavior, even though the mutations are non-replicative in origin, they end up tracking cell divisions. So uh, in, in practice, we probably live in neither of these two limits, and um, it's a euphemism to say that this model is an oversimplification. But nonetheless, I think it kind of conveys two um, important points. The first point it conveys is that there are conditions under which mutations that actually arise from damage nonetheless, nonetheless track cell divisions, and in particular, the rate of cell divisions. And the second is that actually the repair efficiency relative to the length of the cell cycle is a key parameter in determining what we might expect to see. So specifically, um, if we think about both replication-driven mutations or mutations that are non-replicative in origin but very efficiently repaired, then we expect them to look something like this and look quite different in the two sexes. However, if a mutation is due to damage and inefficiently repaired, then we would expect it to accrue with absolute time, at least, again, under the assumption of a fixed instantaneous damage rate. Now, not necessarily at the same rate in the two sexes, because, of course, damage rates might differ between spermatogenesis and oocytes. And so here, I've hypothetically drawn the damage rate as higher in fathers. So what this makes clear, I think, is that you can't just look at the fact that there's a paternal age effect and conclude what the source of mutations is, because in fact, a paternal age effect arises under any one of these scenarios, simply because it also accrues with time. However, you can get quite a lot of insight from seeing whether there's a maternal age effect or not, because there are no cell divisions in the mother after her birth, and therefore that must be an indication that we kind of live somewhere near this regime. It was therefore big news when Johnson et al. a couple of years ago, as well as Wong et al., reported not only a paternal effect on paternal mutations, but a maternal effect on maternal mutations. So now each individual is represented by two points, uh, the number of mutations inherited from mother in red and from father in blue. And you can see that not only is there an increase with paternal age that's linear, uh, but there's also a significant and non-negligible effect of maternal age on maternal mutations, where each extra year basically leads to an extra 0.4 mutations in the child. And so when Johnson et al. reported that, because they noted that there are no uh, cell divisions in the mother after her birth, uh, they concluded that what's going on here uh, is that uh, the differences between the two sexes are due to the relative lack of mitosis in aging oocytes compared with spermatogonia, which may enrich for damage-induced de novo mutations. In other words, what they're hypothesizing is that what's going on in females is damage, 
what's going on in males is due to spermatogenesis and uh, cell replications, uh, DNA replications. What's a bit weird about this explanation is what happens when you look at the mutation spectra that Kelly's been telling us about. So this is just summarizing their data in terms of mutations inherited from mother and father. And you can see that even though there are subtle differences between the sexes, they are, in fact, quite subtle. And so it seems kind of hard to reconcile that with a model in which these mutations in red are coming just from damage or mainly from damage, no, just from damage, and the mutations in blue are coming mainly from replication. And so we became curious to just sort of test that and see whether spermatogenesis is really driving uh, the male bias in mutation. And the way we decided to go about that was just performing the really simple reanalysis of the data of just increasing the ages of the parents and seeing whether, as you would expect, if spermatogenesis is driving the male bias, the male bias goes up with the age of the father. Okay? And so what I'm showing you are our results, um, which were quite surprising to us. So here, it's just sort of the raw data, the fraction of paternal mutations among all phased mutations um, as a function of paternal age for parents who have roughly similar ages. And you can see that there's no hint of a relationship between these two things. And we see it in these data. We see it in independent data by Wong et al. and now also independent to other data sets. Okay. Um, so, we're not making optimal use of the data here because we're only just using phase mutation and there's no model. We can do a bit better by estimating sex-specific increases uh, based on both phased and unphased mutations uh, by maximum likelihood. And so we do that, therefore, using all of the data. And that's what I'm showing you here. Basically, it's the same data plus unphased mutations treated differently. So on the y-axis, male to female mutation rate, and then on the x-axis, now parental ages for couples that have similar ages. And you can see maybe there's a slight hint of an increase, but barely, and perhaps most surprisingly, uh, the ratio is already three to one by puberty. Okay. So what's going on? So there are number of possible explanations. One explanation is that there are actually more cell divisions in males by puberty uh, than the textbooks and Drost and Lee in particular would have you believe. Uh, namely, that by the time the parents have reached puberty, there already have been more cell divisions in the male germline than the female germline. Another possibility, which isn't mutually exclusive, is that there aren't more cell divisions, but each cell division is more mutagenic after sexual differentiation in males than in females. And both of those explanations are potentially um, sufficient to explain why you see a ratio of three to one by puberty. But they don't readily explain the stability afterwards. In fact, they only explain the stability afterwards under really kind of contorted conditions where a whole bunch of per cell division mutation rates and cell division mutation rates mysteriously balance out. So it's mathematically possible, but, but a strong case of special pleading. So what we think is going on instead is that in males too, uh, most mutations are actually due to damage. They have the same source, and that's why their mutation spectra are so similar. And so um, just to take a kind of more in-depth look at that, we decided to consider two mutation types for which there was independent information that suggested that indeed they had a non-replicative source. And the first are these methylated CPGs uh, that I mentioned to you. Um, what's important to know about methylated CPGs is that their developmental trajectories, too, are very different in males and females. And the reason for that is that because after deliberate erasure of methylation marks um, at sexual differentiation, the male, or before sexual differentiation, the male germline is almost instantly remethylated at CPGs, whereas the female germline is in fact not remethylated until shortly before ovulation, which means that if you consider parents at age 40, the male germline has been um, basically methylated for those 40 years with plenty of opportunity for spontaneous deamination, the female germline barely at all before sexual differentiation and just before ovulation. And so we would expect actually a strong age effect for this type of mutations based on this independent information. And interestingly, that is what we see. CPG transitions of the seven types considered are the ones that show the strongest age effect, paternal age effect, sort of counterintuitively, given that the, the one type for which we have really strong evidence of a non-replicative origin. There's a second mutation type that I don't have to time to go into today that Johnson et al. and then more recently we think uh, is a signature of double strand breaks, both spontaneous double strand breaks that are happening in oocytes, as well as a subset of uh, deliberate double strand breaks that are repaired late in meiosis. Um, and these actually increase exponentially with maternal age, presumably because of a constant rate of degradation in the oocyte. Um, and so, uh, 
we see uh, the fa actually a decrease in male bias uh, with father's age. So it, what's interesting to note is that these types of mutations alone comprise about a quarter of all mutations. Um, so you might think, OK, well, this is the signature of damage that you're seeing. But if you look at the other three quarters of mutations that don't include these, then now you will start to see that it tracks spermatogenesis. So we did that. We just excluded these types. And in fact, if anything, I would say there's less of an increase with uh, uh, father's age. This looks pretty flat. Um, and so it looks like these mutation types, too, uh, do not track cell divisions. Okay? So we think, at least, uh, based on these analyses, uh, we know that mutations accrue with paternal and maternal age. Um, and we think we've shown that spermatogenesis is not driving the male bias in mutations, uh, potentially uh, raising the kind of surprising possibility that mutations are not tracking cell divisions. So what about the other line of evidence that's been sort of marshaled in support of uh, cell divisions uh, being the kind of driver of mutations? So we decided to test that by going back to um, this observation that old world monkeys seem to evolve faster than apes um, in uh, phylogenetic data, and specifically to focus on baboons uh, versus humans. So baboons have very different life histories than humans. You will not be surprised to hear. Uh, their female generation time is about 10. Uh, they, males reach puberty earlier, reproduce earlier, but are thought to have a higher rate of spermatogonial stem cell divisions. So in total, it seems like, on average, males go through about double the number of cell divisions between puberty uh, and reproduction in humans compared to baboons. So what would we expect under the assumptions of the generation time effect in which the number of cell divisions is about the same uh, from zygote to germ cell in the two species? Well, if mutations track cell divisions, we should expect the mutation rate per generation uh, to be similar in humans and baboon females, right, who have gone through, by assumption, similar numbers of cell divisions. And second, we would expect the ratio the, of male to female mutations, the male bias, to be higher in humans because humans have gone th through two times the number of cell divisions. And so we decided to test that uh, just by brute force resequencing of some, uh, some baboon and human pedigrees. And we treat these pedigrees um, identically, um, and we focus on orthologous regions of the genomes to make the comparison as fair as possible. So first, just to say that what we get in humans uh, for the parental ages in our sample is almost identical to what, uh, in fact, down to rounding, identical to what uh, Johnson et al., the decode paper, uh, obtains for similar uh, parental ages. And what we get in baboons is about two and a half fold less. So what of our predictions that if mutations track cell divisions, the mutation rate per generation should be similar in human and baboon females? It's not. It's about two and a half fold higher in humans. What of the prediction that the proportion of male mutations should be higher in humans? It's not. It's, in fact, almost identical in the two species. So um, neither of these is consistent with our naive expectations if uh, the mutations are tracking cell divisions. They are consistent with the hypothesis that mutations are predominantly damage-induced, and damage rates are similar in the two species, because the female mutation rates basically just reflect average A's of ages at reproduction, um, and the male bias in mutation is the same in the two species. So if we actually zoom out to the five mammals for which we have direct estimates of male to female ratios of mutations, because we have pedigree data that was able to phase things directly to male and, and well, indirectly, but to maternal and paternal germlines, um, then what we see, quite interestingly, is that the point estimates for the male bias are almost identical whether the species reproduce after months, years, or decades. So again, inconsistent with the notion that the male bias in mutation is tracking the number of cell divisions in males versus females. So what have we learned putting this together? Well, first, that under some conditions, at least, damage-induced mutations can also track cell divisions. Second, that it looks like the male bias in mutation in humans is already present by puberty and not driven by spermatogenesis. Third, that at least based on a comparison of baboons and humans, it looks like maternal mutation rates reflect ages, um, potentially just absolute time, rather than numbers of cell divisions. Um, and at least based on five mammals, the fraction of paternal mutations seems to be uh, pretty invariant to reproductive age. And so together, in my view, uh, these mutations, well, first of all, these lines of evidence suggest that mutations do not track cell divisions. And in my view, they raise the, the possibility, at least, 
that uh, germline mutations are in fact predominantly due to damage. And what I think this summary makes clear also is that the real questions are about how mutations accrue in development. This is really where the gap in our understanding lies. So I think as evolutionary biologists, we tend to think of mutation rates per generation, and then molecular biologists or developmental biologists often think of mutation rates per cell division. I would argue that we should ditch both those concepts. There isn't a mutation rate per generation. There's just a mutation rate at a given maternal and paternal age, and mutation rates per cell division averaged over the developmental trajectory don't seem to mean much if very different stages reflect different balances of replication, damage, and repair. And finally, I want to leave you with one more puzzle, which is how mutations accumulate over evolutionary timescales. A lot of us, myself included, up to a couple of years ago, assumed that this was clearly an indication of reproductive ages. I'm going to argue that maybe it's actually something that co-varies with reproductive ages, like damage rates, metabolic rates, uh, those kinds of traits. Thank you. <laughs>